Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. You know, in keeping with the bottom-up philosophy build of this model, this little guy right here, this is called the knee. This is the next piece I'm going to tackle. And a lot of things go through on and depend on the accuracy of this part. This is what it looks like when you start with it. It is not split. It is not broached. It needs to be split and bored on this side. It needs to be bored and broached and split on this side. Then a cross axis and a cross hole for all the gears that go in there. This little worm drives this little guy. This little guy climbs this rack and that makes the whole table go up and down when you turn this crank. So this is going to be a fun little piece. Going to have to take a look at the dimensional drawing on this to figure out exactly how to start. But the casting is relatively clean. It's not going to take a whole lot of work to get this going. There's only one way to do it. Let's do it. With the part securely clamped and registered on what I believe to be the most trustworthy edges, faces, features of this casting, I will pick up the inside edge of this spacer block right here. That will give me the center of that web. And the backside casting is registered horizontally. There's two fingers. There we go. This way. Against that pin. So the pin is snug, but not secure. I can take it out if I want to. Which I'll have to do when I mill these faces. So I'll find my zero by hitting that, moving off. And then from the back, I will just calculate from the center here to the back face and the sides. Somewhere along the line, you got to trust the casting for something. And I'm trusting the width in the front to be the final dimension so I don't have to cut all of this casting away but I will have to cut some of it and hopefully this top edge stays true to the feature geometry that's there because that does look nice all right let's zero it out chop it up With both sides successfully parallel and the back brought into the center line dimension to the web, I'm going to put a small registration flat right here where it's going to get split so I can use that as a vertical reference when I rotate this part. Banking the part on the freshly cut surfaces and registering the vertical against the known square block. Part is now ready to machine the 
the front and back or the top and bottom of the area that's going to support the table. Ideally, it would be nice if it was in line with the main casting, but there's just not enough material on there to do that. There is no dimension on this, just clean it up at this point. Have at it. Little shop gem for you if you are ever masking off a surface and you can utilize this process, try this. Mask the surface off completely and bend the masking material around the surface that you want to protect. Now instead of using a razor blade, use a file. Go across those edges. When you see the silver shining through, you know you're down to it. go perfect mask quick look after blasting cleaned up really nice pressure set on low and not blasting directly onto your masking tape the media will bounce off you set a real high you're gonna have a problem on your hands but let's see how that worked out beauty and like I've said before, always check your part after blasting for any raised surfaces that may interfere. And I can tell you, even at 30 pounds on material this soft, there is a raised edge. So I'll wipe that across from emery before we proceed. And that's just a matter of popping some holes in. <laughs> Easier said than done. There's a lot going on right here. This is the crank mechanism that will uh, raise and lower the knee on the press. Clean it up, move on. So far, so good. The part is now comfortably nested and located in a quick aluminum fixture that I just knocked out. Still nesting or still banking on the center rib locating surface that I established the outer flats from. So rotationally and vertically, it is controlled by the end surface here. Touching off on a small flat that I put in while it was held vertically. And it is clamped here. This joint in the back is about five tenths off that surface so that it is close but not touching. At this time I can line it up with a pin to the end boss and do these two and the brooch that it's calling for for the gear rack. That's next. Strictly for location and precision, and since the casting hole is already there and rough and off-center, I'm going to bore this hole. I'm going to sneak up on the hole with a variety of plug gauges, 
I have the incremental 1,000th values written on the ends of the pins. It's a lot easier to see that way. So I know I can start with the zero, which is 30. I'm going for 38. So when I get to the zero and the zero drops in, I have eight thousandths more to go. With the hole successfully bored to the 438 required, it is time to move on to the broaching operation. Change the setup, get that done. Only reason I have to change the setup is because I do not have a broaching tool and I have a sneaking suspicion I'm gonna need this machine to make one. The brooch that I'll be using is a piece of 3 8 diameter 17-4 stainless. This is about 10 millimeters. It is smaller than the bore that I'm going into so there is no radial location. This will fit completely inside the bore without any engagement. Machine down to 125, there is a back relief on it and a relief on the face as well. So when this was machined, it was nose down in the machine like this. Exaggerated, nose down. That gives you the back relief and it allows you to nose it up. I did it in a square collar block and put the front relief. Very mild so it doesn't dig. You want it to cut but not dig. Even in a non-hardened state, 17.4 will cut away uh, the cast aluminum that I'm working with so this should work pretty good. I'm going to put it in, try to indicate it as true as possible and shave that little keyway in there. Let's do it. With the brooch set up in the machine and the part returned to the nest I am using a technique called a projected surface. This is an ideal technique for changing a small surface into a large surface or reversing the polarity of a surface for indication. And wiggle the indicator to make sure that the indicator is not stuck. If it ever reads like that, you know that you're good to go. All right, let's recenter it over that particular hole right there. Preset on the digital so I don't have to sweep the hole and ruin the indication of the brooch. Put that slide in. The broaching operation is complete. I'm going to take it to the bench and put a square file down in that notch and make it fit absolutely perfectly. Ideally, if I had more time on my hands, I would have hardened and ground the brooch, but it did not. A little deflection is present, so the gap at the bottom is slightly snug, and I'm not going to lie about that. A hardened brooch is definitely the way to go. Didn't do it. Just going to finish on the bench. After minimal hand filing, 438 pin in place, the rack slides nicely through the brooch groove and is just about 50% into the pocket as intended on the print. Now here's a note for you, when you're using commercially available rack stock like this, make sure that not only is it straight, that the ends are not crushed from the saw off or chop off procedure. And you can see a very slight chamfer on the edge of the teeth. And I got to tell you, I put one on the back as well. Very slight on the brass part. If there's any breakage in your tool as you slot this, you may think that the groove is too small when it's actually not. What a nice free fit like this with the proper gauge pin in place. 
Now we can move on to the pocketing, the screw holes, and the fun stuff. When I decided to hold this part, I could have gone overboard and built a fancy fixture, but I decided to do it this way. Since everything is basically registered and located from the keyway, I used the pin that fit in there and just clamped it on the two parallel faces formed in the previous operation. I did have to go in here with a brooch and knock the corner out here and down on this side. And on this side, I undercut it uh, 20 thousandths off in each direction, 25 thousandths, excuse me, 30 in each direction with a 109 end mill to give it the square corner feature there. Everything else is pretty straightforward. Just make sure you pay attention to the numbers on the print when you do something like this. I'm going to take it out and clean it up. We'll get a closer look at it on the bench. This is a test fit of the subassembly. And this is the elevator mechanism that as you turn the crank, it will raise and lower the table. And you want a nice smooth slip fit here. Even with this uh, axle here, shaft driving down into the casting, it's got to be smooth. And a worm gear goes on here on this side. It's an awful lot of work in this little piece right here. And if this is one of the ones that intimidates you, justifiably so. There's a lot going on, and there's a couple of impossible features on the print that the engineer skipped over. We have three square corners. Two of them are through corners that can be broached, yes. But this one down here is a blind pocket corner, and I could do that as well, but it's just easier to undercut it as such. If there is any binding, you have several options. You can ream a bigger hole in the gear right here. That way it floats a little bit as it tracks. You can remove material from the back of the rack, which would lower the rack and increase the pitch diameters between the two pieces. That would also work. One of the components required to complete this particular subassembly is the cap that goes on the knee. as such. In order to transfer the holes, the features in the knee into the cap, the first thing I'm going to do is put the mounting holes in the cap so, <laughs> so I can mount it. From that point on, I will probably put the knee back in the machine, pick up the features that I need to translate, secure the cap, and translate the features in place, assembled. This is one of those pieces that's a little too short for a short parallel and a little too tall for a narrow parallel and it's just going to present a world of difficulty. So I'm going to make a little aluminum nest for it real quick, a pair of aluminum jaws. And we'll do it that way. That way I can hit the jaw if I have to. You've seen me do that in the past. It's going to come in real handy this time. Go over to the mill, make it happen. Working from the known dimensions on the knee unit that I just finished, I will put in the worm receiver feature in the back of this cap. 
Then I need to flip the cap over and match this feature on the far side for drilling a counterbore. The next feature on this little part is a 250 counter bore in line with this gauge pin on the bottom of the part. Now it's very difficult to hold this part because it's there's just nothing true to reference from other than the surface that you need to reference the feature from. So that's exactly how I'm going to hold it. The plan is align the part true with this piece of scrap aluminum, drill and ream a hole through for alignment purposes, and it's set up invert the whole fixture and come through from the back put the counter bore straight through the fixture straight through into the part and out well not out the other side but the fixture let's take it out of the machine once that is complete we're going to stand the fixture up we're going to move off center we're going to put the gear rack access hole in here and since it is a 50 50 it ought to track fairly true let's put the camera on the tripod and make more sense of that This is a very reliable setup, only the danger is you are pushing the part away from the fixture, so be very delicate when you do this. Additionally, when you do this with a two flute or a four flute and the uh, there is a pilot hole already in there, the chances of forming a donut under the cutter at the break point between the plate and the part is also very possible. So that will increase the pressure. Be careful when you get to that break point there not to do that and mess your setup. Part still feels really good. The whole fixture plate is up against the stop here, so I can go vertical with the plate now and maintain the center line here for the off axis shift for that feature over here. Knowing exactly how thick the plate is allowed me to edge find the back of the plate and move forward to the split line. If you want to pinch whatever's going through here, stay on that side of center. If you want it to float freely, stay on this side of center. I'm going to try to hit it right on the edge. We have a large counter bore inside this piece right here to allow the rack gear to clear the casting. That's why you see the, the feature on the outside. Since the drill gets through one side of this and now falls into that void, looking at this drill profile, I can see the drill walking forward because of the mismatch in the casting. This would happen even if it was assembled. Let's see if we can overcome that with a small end mill plunge, hopefully. A brief look at the assembly, the sub-assembly. The gear is installed. Cap is tight. And that was done with a great deal of success. Now, in order to successfully cut that drill across here, and I'm going to show you this so you don't get burned like I did. I did have a little distortion in the top hole 
when the drill initially made contact with the inside of the fixture, it kicked towards me and elongated a portion of the top hole. Undersize, of course, so I was able to ream most of it to get it on size. But in order to do that successfully, I pocketed the fixture to mimic the inside of the cap so there's equal load on the cutter at all times. It was right in this area here as it broke through the one wall of the cap that it encountered the fixture and started coming towards me. So that would account for the elongation of the top hole. If you're going to do this, I highly recommend you pocket the fixture and keep the load on the tool even, or it is definitely going to walk. Next piece in line is the helical drive mechanism that goes right here so that when you turn the crank, the gear moves. That's next.